country's second largest bank will soon offer a way to get cash without an ATM card. Bank of America joins Chase in announcing card-free technology. New ATMs will allow you to get your money with your smartphone. The move is designed to save customers time. This is the latest way technology is changing how we use money. In 2014, nearly 40% of mobile payment users made so-called point-of-sale purchases with their smartphones. Dan Ackerman, senior editor with our partners at CNET, is here. Good morning. Morning, guys. So wh wh how pronounced is this, and, and what are the implications of it? And you can use your smartphone and get your money. Yeah, all the banks seem to be getting in on this now. Uh, Chase, Bank of America, and the way it works is roughly, instead of taking this plastic card out of your wallet, putting it in the slot, punching in the four-digit code that you probably use for a bunch of other things, they say, oh, instead, take your phone out, log into the app, hopefully biometrically with like a fingerprint reader on your phone, and it gives you what they call look at the ATM card of the future. Craig. Hey, good morning, guys. So imagine getting rid of that ATM card altogether. Some banks insist it would not only be more secure, it would also mean less time at the ATM. Trust me when I say you've got to see it to believe it. Once, just the stuff of science fiction flicks. Good evening, John Iris scanning could soon be coming to an ATM near you. Citigroup is one of several major banks testing a cardless approach to banking, creating a new vision that's intended to be more secure and even easier to use. Simply schedule a transaction, I select a withdrawal, I select the account that I would like to withdraw from, the amount I'd like to withdraw, and I simply hit OK, and I get a notification informing that my transaction is scheduled for redemption later. Once the customer approaches the machine with their mobile device, it scans their iris to verify their identity, and out comes the cash. City is in the very early stages of testing. J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, and Wells Fargo are also considering similar futuristic technology. I have replaced all my passwords with the fingerprint ID. I trust the technology because it's safe. It's your same fingerprint. It's unique. Um, and the same I would think about an iris scanner. Security and convenience are key for consumers. And as mobile payments gain momentum, MasterCard says it's now testing a program that lets you pay using fitness trackers, jewelry, even your car keys. Security experts warn you. It's a first in the nation initiative between a state department of corrections and a county jail system. Iris biometric technology will be used for positively identifying inmates. It has other uses too. Caitlin Birchall reports. We're pleased to announce today the nation's first in kind joint statewide implementation of this remarkable bio biometric technology. Fingerprinting is becoming a thing of the past. Now during the booking process of four county jails, including Penobscot and Somerset counties, the first thing an inmate will do is look into a camera. Thank you for your cooperation. The Department of Corrections can then share that information with county sheriffs. It enables us to positively identify a previously enrolled offender using iris biometric technology. It does so in just a matter of seconds regardless of where they were arrested or who they said they were at that time. In a remote refugee camp in western Thailand, with no electricity, phone coverage, or access to the internet, an unlikely digital revolution is changing lives. Ban Mai Nai Soi Camp. More than 10,000 Myanmar refugees live here, some for a generation. Soon, they'll be sharing technology used at London's Heathrow Airport. The technology is biometrics. The goal is to capture something vital to these people. A confirmed identity. Doug Green is UNHCR's Chief Information Officer. He's here to oversee the deployment of the new system. This exercise in Thailand is critical for UNHCR. This is the first major rollout of the biometric systems. We will verify and enroll 120,000 refugees. Every day, rivers of urban refugees flow into UNHCR's center in Amman to register or to ask for financial help. Registration allows UNHCR to record individual and family details and everyone is identified with biometric iris scanning. This is for, this is for UNHCR's new High Commissioner, Filippo Grandi, came to see the innovative system in action. 
Like there's 42 cubicles which we can undertake registration, and that means that we can process up to 2,500, 3,000 people a day. The El Karim family of 12, parents, grandparents and eight children, are here for their biometric iris scan. Father Nizar helps his youngest twins with the biometric photo. The information also protects children, ensuring certain identification if they get lost or are kidnapped. After this, there'll be a home visit to determine if the family is eligible for cash assistance. If so, getting the money will be quick and easy at a bank branch. The Al Karim family are part of a world first. Once they're scanned by UNHCR, they won't have to register at a bank or open an account. Their eyes will deliver the money directly. Another major story tonight, the World Health Organization took the rare step today of declaring Zika virus and its suspected link to severe birth defects an international public health emergency. I am now declaring that the recent cluster of microcephaly and other neurological abnormalities reported in Latin America, following a similar cluster of French Polynesia in 2014, constitutes a public health emergency of international concern. As a precautionary measure, and because of the association, a coordinated international response is needed to improve surveillance, the detection of infections, congenital malformations, the detection of uh, and neurological complications, to intensify the control of mosquito populations, and to expedite the development of diagnostic tests and vaccines to protect people at risk. Saving lives is not easy. Sometimes we don't know how to prevent disease or death, which is tragic. But there are millions of lives we know exactly how to save. We can save them easily and cost-effectively with vaccines. I like to say that vaccines are miracles. They're miracles because giving children a couple of drops or a shot in the arm can prevent some of the worst childhood diseases for a lifetime. And that, to me, is a miracle. Microsoft billionaire Bill Gates and the British Treasury chief George Osborne have unveiled a new plan to fight malaria. They announced a fund of more than $4 billion for a five-year research program to try and eliminate the world's deadliest disease, which killed up to 440,000 people last year alone. Previous efforts by the Gates Foundation to fund vaccines to eradicate the deadly disease have had some controversial results. A potential cure for the human strand of the papilloma virus was tested in India on teenage tribal girls but resulted in five deaths. According to health activists, dozens were also hospitalized with over 100 cases of children suffering various side effects. In Malawi, in Africa, a previous attempt at a malaria vaccine reportedly killed 47 infants during the clinical trial period. The allegations, though, were denied by a senior officer for the PATH Health Organization, through which the Gates Foundation channeled its funds for the testing. There were deaths during the trial, but none was due to the vaccine. In many of the trial sites, the death rate was below the community average because enlisted children got quick, top-notch medical care. 
Robert Scott Bell, who's a radio host who specializes in health issues, says the biggest problem with any new malaria vaccine is a lack of independent testing, and that brings into question patient safety. We see a similar pattern in, for instance, the biotech industry, where they'll develop a new patented gene technology or genetically engineered compound or food, and they'll test it for safety in-house, basically. Submit that to the government, and the government will sign off on it due to the revolving door between the regulators and the corporation itself. And there's evidence that this is happening with this new ma malaria vaccine, that indeed we're talking about in-house testing and analysis, a lot of employee participation. So there are legitimate questions as to safety and efficacy studies. Have they been analyzed thoroughly through an independent research endeavor, or are they just relying on the submissions by the corporation that that would seek to benefit from the approval and sale of this vaccine globally. By now you're probably familiar with the images that have come out of the water crisis in Flint, Michigan. Shocking images of grimy brown water which residents were told was safe to drink. We now know, of course, that it wasn't, but even now that we know the water supply is basically poisoned, Flint residents are still being expected to pay for that water pumping out of their pipes. And as the Flint crisis rolls on, have you seen these images coming out of St. Joseph, Louisiana? Take a look and then ask yourself these questions. Would you wash your clothes in that? Would you bathe in that? Would you let your children drink that water. Now, most of us are fortunate enough that such questions are hypothetical, but these photos in St. Joseph should remind us that what's happening in Flint is not an isolated incident, and that while the United Nations has declared water and sanitation a human right, people right here in this country are struggling to obtain it. Documents have bubbled up in Flint, Michigan that show state workers were provided bottled water long before the residents were. And here's Adriana Diaz. A year ago, while Flint residents were told their water was safe to drink, despite the taste and foul odor, water coolers were delivered to Flint's state office building. Newly released emails from January 2015 show that the state was concerned about its employees drinking Flint water. The emails were sent days after the city told residents the water contained high levels of a byproduct from treatment chemicals. The city's notice said you do not need to boil your water or take other corrective actions and that the water was drinkable. But the state told its employees in Flint that while the city of Flint states that corrective actions are not necessary, it would provide a water cooler on each occupied floor so you can choose which water to drink. In a radio interview this afternoon, Governor Rick Snyder addressed the issue of state workers getting coolers. They were just doing it as part of their normal operating procedures to make sure they were taking care of responding to those notices. But does it look bad though that state workers yeah. you know, got it, water? No, before the it doesn't help matters at all and again but it was not tied to the lead issue. We asked Flint residents what they thought about the emails. Last when? January. January. A year ago? That's sad. Very, very sad. Americans have now been consuming genetically modified organisms, or GMOs, for 20 years. They account for 80% of processed foods today. But the battle on whether they're safe or not still continues. I'd say one of the, you know, the biggest mistakes, you know, that we made, you know, I certainly, uh, you know, I've, I've feel you know personally involved with this that we didn't do the type of communication and and have the kind of dialogue with consumers that we should have. Dr. Robert Fraley created GMOs in the early 90s for Monsanto which is now the world's largest manufacturer of GMO seeds and seller of the controversial weed killer Roundup which has been under fire by non-GMO activists for decades. Stop poisoning our food Monsanto we don't want it. GMOs have only been around for 20 years. How do we know for sure? Is that enough time that we know for sure that GMOs are safe? The crops have been in the market for 20 years, but GMOs have actually been around since the 1970s because GMOs are now used to, to produce, you know, half of the new drugs that we take. So it's been used across a lot of industry for decades. It's thoroughly studied and the track record has been superb. If GMOs are safe, why not label them? 
we think that the voluntary labeling approaches that are out there make a lot of sense. So, you know, today, you know, if a consumer doesn't want to, you know, consume a GMO product, they can consume an organic product. And consumers are. The demand for non-GMO products are growing rapidly. The biggest food companies in America are starting to come to us and ask to get their products non-GMO project verified, which is really exciting because ultimately it means the consumer wins and they have more access to non-GMO choices. Megan Westgate, the director of the non-GMO project, says the U.S. is one of the only countries in the world that doesn't have GMO labeling. There's 64 other countries have labels. And so there was no way for shoppers here to find whether or not a product had GMOs. So we created the Non-GMO Project to offer a consistent third-party verification program and a label that people can easily look for when they're shopping. Westgate and her team also want to educate consumers about the dangers of consuming GMOs. I think there's a lot of confusion out there and a lot of that is um, encouraged by the biotech companies because they tell people that genetic engineering is an extension of conventional breeding and that it's no different and so that makes a lot of people confused. The reality though is that genetic engineering specifically involves rearranging DNA in ways that don't happen in conventional breeding that can't happen in nature. Why was there a need for GMOs in the first place? Well, you know, here, here's the big picture. Uh, you know, world population continues to grow. You know, we have 7.2 billion people today. You know, by the time you're my age, uh, there's going to be, you know, 10 billion people. You know, the demand for food between now and 2050 doubles. And so we need all kinds of new technologies to help farmers produce more food to, to feed uh, the world. Economic growth slowed sharply in the fourth quarter of last year to just seven-tenths of one percent, down from two percent in the third quarter. Walmart laid off about 10,000 workers this month as it closed 154 stores in 27 states. Many of them were the only place to buy groceries. Here's David Begno. Shopper Tabitha Snow watched as the front doors to her Walmart neighborhood market were covered last night. In the big cities, you know, there's a grocery store on every corner. I don't get what small town living is like and how important having a grocery store here is. America's biggest private employer is pulling out of White Wright, Texas, just a year after opening here, leaving this town of nearly 1,700 people without a grocery store for 22 miles. They didn't even celebrate a year anniversary, and they're shutting it down. That's crazy. Retha Thompson has two daughters-in-law who worked at this Walmart. They chose to come here. And then when they put the other grocery store out of business, they want to close down and leave. I'm mad. Pettit's was the mom and pop grocery for nearly 60 years, the only one in town. It closed nine months after Walmart opened here. Larry Deeds was co-owner. What made you close? The business. They just quit coming. Walmart stole your business. Yeah. Hundreds of airline employees had been marching in Karachi against government plans to privatize the ailing national airlines, fearing massive layoffs. They'd been striking near the airport and say paramilitary forces started firing after a confrontation with police who'd been trying to keep the protesters back. A hospital official says at least two protesters were killed and eight others injured. The violence comes after months of protests by employees of Pakistan International Airlines and only a day after the enactment of legislation restricting airline employees from striking for six months. Violators face fines and a year in prison. Arrests are the last tactic they can use on us. Let them try that also. Pakistan International Airlines was once a source of great pride for this country, but the government is cautioning employees if they continue their strike, they'll be treated as enemies of the state.
According to the Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, an Su-24 uh, warplane belonging to the Russian Air Force entered Turkish airspace at approximately noon on Friday, despite warnings in English and Russian. Russian Air Force is uh, currently, of course, in northern Syria, conducting airstrikes in support of the Syrian government. Erdogan did say that he sees this latest incident as a result of Russia's efforts to escalate the crisis in the region and also underlined that the issue is being closely monitored by NATO. The NATO Secretary General Jan Stoltenberg has warned Russia of the dangerous results of such actions. He urged Russia to take all necessary measures to ensure that such violations do not happen again. He called on Russia to act responsibly and to fully respect NATO airspace. Moscow has dismissed as baseless Ankara's claims that Russian aircraft have violated Turkish airspace again. Russian Defense Ministry spokesman Igor Konashenkov said the allegation is only propaganda. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan earlier warned Russia of consequences if it keeps violating Turkey's sovereignty. The warning came shortly after the Turkish Foreign Ministry said a Russian aircraft had entered Turkey's airspace on Friday despite radar warnings. Ankara is accusing Russia of violating once again its uh, airspace in the course of its anti-ISIL campaign. President Erdogan already calling on Vladimir Putin to explain. It summoned the Russian ambassador and talking about it, a violation of, quote, NATO airspace. So it's really bringing NATO into this whole conflict. Turkey, of course, is a NATO member. However, we're... Russia has accused Turkey of shelling a village in the Syrian territory. Russia's defense ministry says it has received footage showing the shelling. It demanded explanation from Turkey, NATO, and the U.S. over the incident. The Syrian government has condemned Turkey's recent cross-border shelling as a blatant breach of international law. Syrian media say Damascus considers the shelling a crime against Syrian civilians, adding that the government reserves the right to respond to this heinous crime with all available means. The condemnation comes a day after artillery was fired into Syria's northern Latakia province from Turkey, killing one fighter loyal to the Syrian government. The Pentagon chief Ashton Carter has announced a fourfold increase in the U.S.'s defense budget for Europe in the last couple of hours, citing Russian aggression as the main reason for it. Washington plans now then to spend a whopping $3.4 billion countering it. The emergence of ISIL and the resurgence of Russia were taking a strong and balanced approach to deter Russian aggression, reinforcing our posture in Europe to support our NATO allies in the face of Russia's aggression. Russia topped Ashton Carter's list of global challenges facing America. He also cited two in order China, North Korea, followed by Iran. Islamic State, uh, you might find it a bit peculiar to hear, was mentioned down the list in fifth place. Though the U.S. Defense Secretary wants to spend more on fighting ISIL than on security in Europe, $7.5 billion. Experts believe that Washington's seeking to become the world's sole military superpower. I've emphasized this. We're in a new world. Uh, Russia is not our enemy, should not be treated as our enemy. And this, you know, frankly, this is absurd. When you, when you consider the fact that this is uh, the Secretary of Defense for Barack Obama, who is a Democrat, a liberal, uh, you know, this shows that the United States political scene has ended into complete insanity. Britain's foreign ministers lashed out at Russia and President Putin, saying the country's actions in Syria are undermining the international peace effort. Let's get more from our correspondent in London, Polly Boyka. Hi there, Polly. Uh, didn't spare his language, did he, uh, Philip Hammond? He's used some quite strong uh, rhetoric here. What was actually said? Put a bit more meat on the bones of this. Yeah, he didn't mince his words. I have to say, these aren't the most diplomatic comments uh, I've heard coming from uh, Philip Hammond. He accused Russia of bombing uh, opponents of the Syrian government rather than Islamic State targets. He said that through its actions, Russia had strengthened the Islamic State uh, in Syria rather than uh, diminishing the terrorists' capabilities. That's the crux of what he said. But take a listen to how he said it. The Russians say, let's talk. Then they talk and they talk and they talk. The problem with the Russians is while they are talking, they're bombing and they are supporting Assad. They're bombing the moderate opposition. Their intervention is strengthening Daesh on the ground, doing the very opposite of what they claim to be wanting to achieve. 
That problem with the Russians' comment almost sounds as if he was caught off guard, or as if perhaps he didn't know that he was speaking on the record, because it's quite、uh, aggressive and exasperated language to hear from a top diplomat. Philip Hammond also said. A senior adviser to Iran's leader Ayatollah Said Ali Khamenei meets with Russian President Special Envoy for Syria in Moscow, Ali Akbar Velayati, and Alexander、uh, Lavrentiev. Have stated that Tehran and Moscow will pursue a common approach to help work out a political solution to the crisis in Syria. Both sides also stress the Syrian people's right to self-determination without external interference. The two officials discuss the framework of、uh, quadrilateral cooperation among Iran, Russia, Iraq, and Syria to fight terrorist groups. The、uh, Iranian official arrived in Moscow on Monday for a four-day visit at the invitation of the Russian side. Of the、uh, Atomic Energy Organization of Iran says the country will soon launch the construction of two new nuclear reactors in the southern city of Bushehr.、Uh, we have this、uh, agreement with the Russians. We have the contract signed between Iran and the Russia to、uh, to construct another two big reactors in Bushehr, and、uh, we will be launching uh, uh, the first of these two reactors, the new ones. Hopefully,、uh, the, the launching of the construction will be in a few months'、uh, time. Iran has successfully test-fired its new generation cruise missiles as part of ongoing army exercises. The missiles, named Nur, have ranges between 150 to 300 kilometers. The projectiles were fired on the third day of Iran's navy drills in the Sea of Oman and the northern part of the Indian Ocean. A military exercise that spreads across three million square kilometers in the east of the Strait of Hormuz, the Oman Sea, and the Indian Ocean. Today, different classes of submarines, including Tariq, Qadir, and Sabahad, managed to perform several tactical operations under the sea. They also torpedoed moving targets. Iran's navy says that the drill is a display of its military might, but this also appears as a chance to demonstrate the efficiency of weapons. And defense systems that are either made or optimized by Iran. More than three decades of arms embargoes against the Islamic Republic prompted Iran to gradually develop its own defense industry. پهپاد شناسایی تاکتیکی نیروی دریایی با پرواز بر فراز ناب هواپیما بر اطلاف آن را شناسایی و علاوه بر تأثیر برداری دقیق از سامانه های نصب شده در این ناب نسبت به ارسال همزمان این تصویر اقدام کرد. یه علمی کارکنان پهپادا هست که این گونه تونست نزدیک بشن و فیلم به این زیبایی و با این دقت از یگان رزمی نیروهای فرامنطقی به دست بیاد همچنین یک فروند زیر دریایی کلاس قدیر با دارا بودن سامانه های کشف راداری پیشرفته با رعایت اختفای کامل مسئولیت شناسایی و تحصیل برداری For the second time in four months, the U.S. Navy sent one of its warships in territorial waters claimed by China Chinese leaders are calling it a severe provocation and a violation of Chinese law Susan, thanks very much. It has been an active week involving disputed waters off the Chinese mainland, including high-level diplomatic talks between the U.S. and China in an attempt to find a way forward in the region. But just two days after those discussions, another military maneuver by the U.S. It's the latest flare-up in tensions between the United States and China over disputed areas within the South China Sea. U.S. military leaders admit. The U.S. Navy destroyer Curtis Wilbur sailed into waters that China claims, with the U.S. saying it was a challenge by claims by mainland China, Taiwan, and Vietnam. China is not taking the action lightly. A defense ministry spokesman called the move a deliberate provocation, adding the U.S. act severely violated Chinese law, sabotaged the peace, security, and the good order of the water, and undermined the region's peace and stability. In a sign of heightened awareness, the U.S. move prompted the PLA to activate a garrison on the island. A Pentagon spokesman doesn't deny the U.S. warship deliberately came within 12 miles of the Shisha Islands, but the U.S. doesn't recognize China's claim to the region, saying they are challenging what they label excessive attempts to restrict navigation in the South China Sea. 
South Korea's defense ministry says the military is continuing to monitor the DPRK for any signs of a launch. The comments came after Japan's Kyoto News reported the DPRK might be preparing another long-range missile launch. Meanwhile, Japan's defense ministry has installed missile interceptors at its headquarters in central Tokyo and ordered destroyers operating in the Sea of Japan to be ready to target any DPRK missiles. comes as an anonymous U.S. defense official told the Associated Press that the U.S. has seen activity at a DPRK ballistic missile test site that is consistent with previous tests. This comes just three weeks after the DPRK drew international condemnation for t conducting its fourth nuclear test. Terrible tragedy and horror out of Nigeria. Radical Islamist group Boko Haram burned children alive as part of a vicious attack Saturday night. They hit the northeastern village of Delori, as well as two other refugee camps nearby. Survivors say firebombs were thrown on huts with people inside. Soldiers on the scene also reported that three female suicide bombers detonated as people tried to escape. Officials say nearly 90 people were killed. Moving on now, the European Union's Criminal Intelligence Agency announces that at least 10,000 unaccompanied child refugees have gone missing after arriving in Europe. Europol says 5,000 children have disappeared in Italy alone, with another 1,000 missing in Sweden. Stockholm says it has very little information about what happens after their disappearance. In the United Kingdom, the number of the disappeared has doubled over the past year, raising fears about their exploitation by criminal gangs. Europol says it has received evidence that some unaccompanied child refugees have been sexually exploited. It urged the public to watch out for the missing refugee kids who would most probably be hiding in plain sight. Minors make up at least a quarter of the million arrivals in Europe last year. The rise in anti-Muslim sentiment in the UK is making some MPs consider whether even the Christian Bible should be read out loud in public. The fear is it could incite religious hatred amid already tense times, with scenes like the following on the streets of British cities. It's a Christian country. It's a Christian country. Yes, it is. This is a Christian country. You're jealous. You're jealous that we're taking over. You're not taking over. Yeah, what are you not doing here? Why are you closing up? You've got to be Muslim to come to Logan. Wow! I'm Muslim to take over. Watch! Reject the false prophet Muhammad and follow the true saviour of the world, Jesus Christ our Lord. What? Christianity is the main religion in the UK, with 59% considering themselves Christians. Muslims make up the second largest group, 4.8%, but it's growing fast. In fact, the number has increased by more than a million in a decade. Over 8% of school-aged kids are from Muslim families, and Mohammed was the most popular boy's name in England and Wales in 2014, all of which is causing some national soul-searching, as Polly Boyker investigates. An increasing number of people here now say that Britain is no longer a Christian country, that it should be a secular state with no official religion. And that's what's being debated here at the British Academy. The generation who went to church because it was the thing to do are now in their 70s, 80s. So the figure will get lower. Facts like these are hard to argue with. We have to try to make the debate a debate, and all four of us have agreed over quite a wide, <laughs> wide range of issues. Uh, I'm not sure if I can help at this point, because I agree with what Dermot has just said. And then there's this thorny issue. As one student recently said to me, my mum's so Daily Mail, she's only Christian when Islam is in the news. I want to find out what the audience thought. Any religion, whatever you want to worship, is fine, but don't impose it on me. You agree with some of the views there that um, the church should be disestablished, that it's no longer relevant? Uh, I think it should be disestablished. Um, I'm actually training for ordination in the Church of England. I think that there will always be um, a remnant of people who profess Christian faith. Um, I think. A remnant sounds ever so small a number of people. <laughs> well, I mean, has it ever... Well, OK. Do you think the church is still relevant today in British society? I do, but it's such a struggle these days. I personally think it's still relevant. Uh, the question is, is it still a Christian function? And the views are pretty diverse. So this Church of England is Church of Satan. 
Satan, because mammon, money. So the Church of England is the Church of Satan. Well, the debate is over, but one question remains, and that is, given the dramatic rise in atheism here in the UK, as well as an increasing popularity of other religions, how long until the British government has to confront the issue of the UK's fading Christianity head on? Reporting from London, I'm Polly Boyko. China has detained the senior pastor of the country's first megachurch. Since 2005, Joseph, Joseph Gu has led Changi Church, China's largest Protestant church. It's an official government church in the Chuyang province. Christian activists say the pastor may be detained in a secret location known as a black jail. Pastor Gu has been an outspoken critic of the forced removal of the church of the church crosses rather in Chuyang. According to China Aid's Bob Fu, Gu is the highest ranking national church leader arrested since China's Cultural Revolution. Joining me today from Florida, the founder and chairman of Liberty Council and attorney for Kim Davis, uh, Matt Staver. Matt, thank you very much for talking to us. Appreciate it very much. Uh, you said, good to be with you, you said recently that uh, Gays are now imposing a jizya tax. What does that mean? Well, I, I made an analogy. You know, in some countries where they pose a tax on people uh, who do not uh, conform to a Muslim ideology, here in America we have somewhat like that in terms of people being fined, whether it's the farmer being fined $12,500 for not being able to have his facility used for a same-sex wedding, or the the florist or the baker being fined, in the case of the baker, $135,000 or so. We shouldn't be fined whether we're living in a country that imposes a Jesus tax or certainly in America for exercising yeah. our faith that conflicts with someone else. But unlike... But our nation has a spiritual problem. And uh, we, we, need, we, need, uh, we need God's forgiveness. We need re to repent of our sins and turn from our sins. Because I do believe that uh, God's judgment will come on this nation when we read in the scripture. Uh, we see how God judged Israel uh, time and time again when they would turn their back on him and begin to worship other gods, foreign gods, and God would bring judgment on, on Israel. And I believe God could bring judgment on America.